Hello and welcome to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. I'm your host, Bo Eckstein. Today we have a great show because we're not going to be talking about multifamily. We're not going to be talking about house flipping. We're going to be talking about short-term rental investing, which uh, I, I, I was just telling our guests today that I missed the boat. I should be acquiring properties. It's in my wheelhouse. You know, get 4X cash flow on, on what would be a long-term rental income. So it really makes sense and there's still a need for it. You know, everybody talks about saturation, but there's such strong demand. So please welcome to the show, Tony Robinson. Uh, you probably already have seen him. He's the host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Podcast. They have several million downloads at this point, and they're really growing. I think everybody that wants to get into real estate investing, they're, they're starting there because that's the platform to launch them. And I think it's, it's bringing, I mean, Bigger Pockets has so many channels now. It's amazing to watch Bigger Pockets grow. So mm-hmm. welcome to the show, Tony. Thanks for joining us. And Bo, thank you for having me, brother. I, I appreciate you reaching out. And we were talking before uh, we started recording and I actually found you first uh, watching some of your YouTube videos and you reached out to me to, to be on the podcast, man. So it was, it was meant to be. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's a power of social media and, you know, the information's there for people. And that's why having a great guest like you to kind of, I know you got started in single family and long-term rentals and then something, there was a light bulb that clicked and you, mm-hmm. so maybe somebody introduced it to you, maybe you saw a podcast or listened to a podcast and you just went into the short-term rental business. Can you just walk me through like when that happened and yeah. how that happened? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of take it back to the the beginning of my my investing journey. So, Bo, I, I got my very first real estate deal in October of 2019. Um, so we're we're a little over two years away from that first deal. And before I started investing, I knew that I wanted to scale. Right, I knew that I wanted a big portfolio. Portfolio. Um, at the time, I was still working a W two job, and my goal was to be in a position to uh, to walk away from that job. And you know, I'm, I'm a math guy, I'm a, a numbers guy, and you know, you do the math on a bunch of single family houses, and I knew I would I would need a lot of those uh, to replace at the time, which was a, a six figure income from my W two job. So before I even started investing, I knew that I needed to move into an asset class that was bigger that allowed me to scale faster. So my initial intentions were to move into multifamily. I wanted to to be an apartment syndicator, right? You know, I'd done a lot of research. That seemed like the best way to scale to a big portfolio in a relatively short amount of time and, you know, quickly replace my W-2 income. But, you know, I was hadn't done any real estate deals ever. Um, I was going to be hard pressed to find someone that was going to, you know, want to invest in me as this first time apartment syndicator that had never done it before. So I knew that I needed a track record. Um, so I said, okay, let me let me start in the single family space first. Let me get a few long-term rentals under my belt. Um, and then once I've done that, I'll have proven myself and it should be really easy to become an apartment syndicator. At least that was, that was my thought process. Um, so I go out, I buy, I think we had four long-term rentals. Um, and I said, okay, cool. Now, now's the time. Let's see if we can do this apartment syndication thing. So, you know, I spend, you know, me and my partner spend like 20 grand on, on a, on a big mastermind program. We go out there, we're doing everything we're supposed to do. We're networking with brokers. We're, you know, trying to analyze these deals. And it's just like every single deal we're getting is complete garbage, right? Like the numbers don't make sense. And, you know, it's probably been passed over by like dozens of other, um, dozens of other investors already. And then COVID happens, right. Which, which kind of complicates things even more. Um, so we're, we're just kind of spinning our wheels, trying to get this apartment syndication thing going. And then a, a buddy of ours says, Hey, I know you guys are thinking about uh, investing in apartments, but, um, I just bought this cabin in Tennessee and I think it's going to cash for like crazy. And when he showed us his numbers, you're like, Oh, like, oh man, like if you can really do that, like this is going to be a great investment. So we've been sitting on some capital that we were waiting for this apartment deal that never came. And we said, you know what, why don't we go out and follow our buddy out to Tennessee? Let's buy a cabin. And we, uh, we end up doing that, Bo. And uh, it's, it's in the middle of COVID. Uh, it's the summer of 2020. So people are still really uncertain of, of kind of where things are going to go. And we end up getting a killer deal, man. And, and that first short-term rental, we got a 138% return uh, in the first year. And, and that's, that's what hooked us, man. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So I know the Smoky Mountains is probably where you bought. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of friends that are invested there. And it's like the number yeah. one t- tourist destination. I mean, right now there, it's crazy. Prices have gone up so much since you bought and mm-hmm. purchased your property, right? And, and most, so- de- most definitely, man. And that, that's that's part of the challenge there as well. Like just as a quick you know, side note, we bought our first property. Um, it was a five bedroom, five bath cabin. $590,000 is what we paid for it. That same cabin today, you know, not even two years later is worth a million bucks. So that, that's how much prices have gone up in that market. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, um, 
So now that now obviously you 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 got excited and yeah. it's it's working. Yeah. Is it true um as a general rule of thumb that you should like whatever you pay for the property you should get about uh, you, the gross revenue for first year should be somewhere around 15%. Is that kind of like a rule of thumb, kind of like the 1% rule? Yeah, it is, man. We, we typically shoot for at least 20% somewhere in that ballpark. Um, but yeah, some, some 15 to 20, 25% is, is generally a good rule of thumb. Okay. So, so we're in a different market than when you started, obviously COVID mm-hmm. just supercharged this whole, I mean, people are, you know, working remote and saying, let's yeah. go, I can go to Tennessee and the Smokies and I can, bring my laptop and I could work and I can stay there for 10 days with the kids. But now like, w- where's your focus now? Like where, because the, the deals aren't probably as easy to come by in the Smokies. Mm-hmm. How do you source other markets? Are you just strictly looking at vacation rental markets or you look mm-hmm. for like the normal markets as well? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Bo. And I'll, I'll answer that in kind of two separate pieces. So first, in, in terms of how we're finding deals, then I'll answer the question on uh, kind of the markets that we look at. So first, in, in terms of deal finding, um, we, we've had to expand out into other markets to be able to find the return that we're looking for. There are still properties for sale in Tennessee, right? There are still properties for sale out there that you can go and buy, um, but we won't be able to capture the kind of return that we want uh, for most of our properties. So we honestly haven't purchased anything in the Smoky Mountains in, um, in uh, almost, uh, almost a year now. Um, so what we've done is we've started expanding into, into other markets. Um, so shortly after we invested in Tennessee, we moved into to Joshua Tree, which is another national park, um, and now we've expanded into multiple other markets as well. Um, so, you know, we're we're really looking at places that still have the strong infrastructure of of short term rentals, right? Where there, there's strong, consistent demand throughout the year, uh, but we're looking for places where the price points haven't seen the the same kind of upward pressure that you've seen in markets like Tennessee and, and Joshua Tree. So that, that's kind of what we're doing now. So we're we're also going for non turnkey properties. So when we first started investing. Uh, the first, I think, two properties that we purchased, there were existing short-term rentals that we bought and pretty much just had to spruce up and we were able to go live pretty quickly. Uh, but now we're at the point where, you know, the vast majority of what we're buying um, is like a rehab, right? We've got to go in, renovate this property, you know, get it all designed and, and pretty much a ground up uh, kind of restart. So we've changed our, our strategy as well from going to turnkey to, to buying some, some rehab type properties. Um, so that, that's how we're, we're kind of finding deals today. So... Um... So, so you, you look at a deal, you run it through maybe like an air DNA of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, you get their conservative estimates, you figure, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you jump on Airbnb and some VRBO and you, you you see what the competition looks like. And then you just model it on a pro forma and, Mm -hmm. and it's really a quick underwrite, um, from that standpoint to take a quick look if the deal makes sense. Right. Because you, it's not like a complex, we got to look at this huge Excel spread for these multifamily deals. These are yeah. these are quicker to to play. What are what are some things that if if somebody's starting to vet these opportunities, would would you have them go to AirDNA first? What what's your process when you're doing a quick look to underwrite a deal like a back of the napkin type of underwrite? So there, there's three things you need to analyze a a short term rental. You need your projected uh, ADR, which stands for your average daily rate. You need your projected occupancy. And then you need your projected cleaning fee income. And I'll I'll kind of break down each one of those separately. So first is your ADR. So your average daily rate. So when you think about an apartment complex or you think about storage or you think about a single family house, someone's signing a contract with you for an extended period of time. And you know, without fail, you know, as long as they don't, you know, they don't go delinquent, that they're going to pay that amount every single month. So if someone signs a lease with you on a single family house for $1,000, you know, every month on the first, you're getting $1,000. So your income is fixed. With short-term rentals, uh, it's more like the, the hotel industry where you have, instead of tenants that stay, you have guests that come in, right? They're going to stay for maybe one to two nights and they're going to check out, check in. Um, and our properties turn between 12 and 15 times per month. Um, and every single guest that checks in is paying a different rate. And that's going to vary depending on the day of the week. It's going to vary depending on the month of the year. It's going to vary depending on availability of other listings. So there's a lot of factors that go into what we charge. So when you're looking to analyze a short-term rental, you want to figure out over the entire year, what is the average price that someone might be willing to pay for this property? The way that we figure that out, there, there's data platforms like AirDNA. Uh, we typically use Price Labs, but you can also do it for free, Bo. And the way to do it for free is, so that you're looking at a property, it's a, whatever, a five bedroom cabin in the Smoky Mountains. All you have to do is go into Airbnb and look for a property that's similar to the one that you're looking to buy. 
open up their calendar at Airbnb and just look over the next you know month, 60 days, six months, was what is it that they're that they're charging guests? And that can give you a good idea. And if you do that for you know two or three or four properties, you'll have a, a pretty good idea of what you can charge for yours over an annual basis. So that's the first one is your ADR. Okay. And then just um kind of circling back on that. Um, where how do you get a good snapshot? Cause like it might be really good during this time of the year versus mm-hmm. like four months ago. So yeah. how do you look how do you look at a, a 12 month track record of these type of properties? Yeah. So within Airbnb, that's why I recommend looking like multiple months out, because if if you, if you just look at the next 30 days, you don't know if that's peak season or if that's slow season. Right. And if it's slow season, you're going to undershoot what that property might do on an annual basis. And if it's peak season, you're going to way overshoot what that property might do. So if you look at 30, 60 and 180, that'll typically kind of let you hit both peak and, um, and slow time. So that's what we do. But when you're, when you're using the pay tool, like, again, we use price labs, it gives you so much more data. Like I can see historically going back to the beginning of 2020, um, what the average prices were for comparable properties in my market. So it gets really easy to make sure that we're, we're capturing the right data there. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Hi, this is Bo Eckstein, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. I appreciate you checking out our channel. On this podcast, we talk about real estate, investing, financing, business lending, and acquiring and expanding your business. I'm sure you will find some videos here that will help you build your business empire. There's a lot to see. Take your time and make sure you comment, like, and subscribe. Thanks again. Do you, do you have a simple temp, uh, t- uh, underwriting Excel template that you use or where would you recommend just to plug in the numbers so we can do kind yeah. of a quick underwrite of a deal? Yeah, absolutely. We actually have a free calculator. So if, if you go to alphageekcapital.com forward slash calculator, um, that'll take you to uh, to our free download. Cool. I'm going to definitely use that because like I was yeah. telling you earlier, I don't I own all long term rentals. It's like, yeah, uh, <laughs> and, it, so, and it's a quick one. It's a quick and easy one, but, but it's like a one pager. You know, everything's highlighted where you need to fill it in. So it's it's not going to give you like everything you would get with a you know commercial underwriting uh, kind of form, but uh, it gives you the basics you need for a short term rental. Yeah, no, that's what I need because I, I that's what I do yeah. with my long term. I have a really simple cloud based calculator and I just plug everything yeah. in and it it's beautiful. So that. Yeah. And try to make it easy because you got to look at a lot of deals to really find one. Are you ever doing any like value add where where you're doing rehab and then you're are you kind of like burying these properties so you can kind of create value? Like, okay, this needs a remodel, and then or is that just not your model? No, that that most definitely is right. And we've kind of been forced into doing that because um, that's what the inventory allowed us to do. Now, luckily for us, um, our first like all of our long term rentals were burrs. Um, so we already had some experience managing rehabs from, you know, and even from a distance, I was in California, I was managing a burr that was in, in Louisiana. Um, so I wasn't afraid of taking on a rehab job. So when the market kind of tightened up and the inventory of turnkey properties, you know, was no longer there, it was easy for us to kind of transition into doing some, some burrs on the, on the short-term rental side as well. So as COVID started, it, there was kind of a freeze in the short-term rental business. Then all of a sudden there was a boom. Right. And it, it seems I'm in a lot of uh, Facebook groups for short-term rentals. And, you know, I'm just, I just always reading because obviously I can help them finance, but I'm also curious for my acquisitions. So this is like where people are buying. And it seemed like there was like a good 20% kind of uptick in kind of like gross revenues that people were seeing in, in most markets. Is that, do you think that's sustainable or is that more of just the COVID factor or is this, are we going to see this in the rest of 2022 and your kind of best guesstimation? Yeah. So, you know, I I don't have the crystal ball, Bo, but, you know, I I do my best to listen to other authorities in this space. And, you know, Airbnb does a tremendous amount of research on, you know, obviously their their market, their guests, um, their customers. And uh, last year, Airbnb said that they they were short one million hosts on Airbnb to keep up with their projected demand. Um, And on whatever data, based on whatever data that Airbnb is looking at as a company, their strong belief is that COVID has caused a permanent shift in how people travel. Um, You're seeing a lot more businesses that are just staying remote, where where they're not going to bring people back into the office ever. Um, You're seeing kind of this great resignation of people who are leaving jobs that that they had before COVID and looking for jobs that allow more flexibility. Um, And you're seeing a a shift in how people want to travel. There was, uh, I think, a very 
um, you know, COVID kind of made people like, ah, I don't know if I really want to share, you know, this space with this many people. Like if I go on vacation now and it's me and my, my, my parents and my kids and my cousins, instead of us getting five hotel rooms, we just want one big cabin in the Smoky Mountains that we can all share together. So, you know, when I, when I look at the data that Airbnb is provided on their projections for um, kind of where the short-term rental industry is going, I, I don't think that what we're seeing is like a, you know, like a false positive. I think it's a, almost a permanent shift in how people are traveling. Cool. And so uh, let's talk about operations. Um, yeah. You know, we have some people that say, I want to outsource this. I'm going to use advanced stay or um, uh, Picasso, Picasso. Yeah. Right. and they're taking typically 15 to 25% seems like yeah. on the, off the top. Yeah. So uh, you're operating these yourself, correct? When you're building out your cleaning crews and so forth. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that's what it seems to be. It seems um, what's the biggest um, bottleneck in your business as you sk- as you grow your uh, short term rental portfolio. Is it the the conversations between you know people messaging you on BNB or have you already found a virtual assistant that's handling that? What 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 are some tips in this whole bottleneck thing as you go from multiple properties? Yeah, so we're we're kind of reaching that point right now where we're we're starting to to almost operate at the red line when it comes to um, you know kind of managing all the properties. So. Um, our, our bigger bottleneck right now is, is the labor. Um, so finding good cleaners to, to continue to scale and grow with us is our portfolio scale. So um, I actually have an, an ad up right now on Indeed, um, trying to source some more cleaners uh, to, to kind of help as our portfolio scale. So finding good people to, to kind of maintain the properties uh, continues to be a challenge. Um, and then the second piece, yeah, it's just like the actual communication with the guests. Um, so we are in the process of building out some SOPs and like a training platform so we can bring in some maybe virtual help um, from overseas probably to do with at least a lot of those frontline uh, communications. Uh, right now, it's just me and my team that are, that are managing that ourselves. Yeah, I, I, uh, I gave a training video to my friend on because um, I, I, in the Bay Area, I ran a real estate club and I gave him a training on you know, the running a a short-term rental business. And he took it. And literally in the last 18 months, he's gotten five properties. He's, he's like netting 30 grand a month. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching it. And then I know all this stuff because I interview all these guests and I said, Hey, you should look at doing cost segregation. And, and he's like, yeah, I saved about $200,000 on my taxes this year. (laughs) I'm thinking, God, I should be doing this for myself. I'm (laughs) like, but that, you know, that's the fun. So, so really to kind of switch focus for a minute here is how did, how did you, um, and bigger pockets connect? That's an interesting story. And and it's, it's great because you actually present really well. So I'm just curious on how that relationship started. Yeah, thank you, bro. And I, I appreciate that, brother. And, you know, I, I mentioned at the top of the show that I got my first deal in October of 2019. Um, I started recording a podcast of my own. It was called Your First Real Estate Investment. I started recording that in like August of 2019. So I, I didn't even have my first deal done, but I was already working on launching this podcast. And the reason I did that was because I knew that if I wanted to scale to anything meaningful, I was going to need some kind of platform. Right? I, I was going to need an opportunity for people to know <clears throat> who Tony J. Robinson is and, and like me and trust me. Um, so that way, when I have these different opportunities, I have a, a network of folks that might be interested in, in working with me. Um, so before I even had my first deal, I had a podcast. Um, I was still working at the time as well, but right? I, had, I had a really busy W2. I was putting out three episodes a week. And I did that every, every week for like six months. Um, and then I eventually scaled back, but through me doing my own podcast and, and, and producing so much content and, you know, meeting so many other investors, right. I was talking to three different investors every week. Um, I met someone who was connected to bigger pockets and, um, when they were looking, you know, they had already launched the, the rookie show, but they were looking to replace one of the hosts. And, um, they came to me and said, Hey, Tony, we like what you're doing. You know, if you're interested, we'd love to, to kind of have you step into this seat. So it was me doing a lot of work on my own bill before, um, you know, that, that opportunity presented itself, but me being ready. Um, but it was my network really that, that led to that opportunity. That's awesome. And I'm, I'm yeah. sure it's very, you, you enjoy it probably because you get to talk to people and figure out what people are doing, just like we're doing right now. This is a great way yeah. to learn is I'm asking you questions that I know yeah. people out there that are watching this are going to want to know, because it's, it's like, you can get, I believe after um, you can get your financial independence a lot quicker with a lot less houses with short-term rentals. And it's Absolutely. not as, not as overwhelming as these multifamily properties. My mm-hmm. friend that I just told you about the same thing, he was, he was going through like a, a mastermind group on how to underwrite multifamily deals. And he was getting kind of frustrated. He's a smart guy, but he's just like, it's, there's a kind of like an intimidation factor, but right, buying a single right. family home and everyone can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And he just got the bug and he just took off with it. And so it's, it's, it's awesome to see. And I know like, 
it doesn't take too many house. I mean, it could literally be one or two houses that could re replace your W two job, yeah. which is pretty amazing, right? Like, but let me, if I can, I want to share my story a little bit. I, I, sure. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, so I actually, I actually lost my job in December of 2020. And, um, you know, I've been at the company for like almost four years, two days before Christmas, I get this unexpected call and, and, you know, five minutes later I'm unemployed. Um, so at that point we had, uh, three short term rentals. Uh, we had one in Tennessee, we had two in, uh, in Joshua tree and, uh, my company, it's me, my wife, and then we have a third partner. And, um, you know, after I got, after I got let go, I was, you know, I looked at my wife, I was like, Hey, we, we've got a decision to make. It's like, either I can, you know, I can go back, I can get a job and I'm a smart enough guy and I've got good, good skills. Um, or maybe I don't go back and we try and really grow the short-term rental portfolio. Um, so after, you know, a lot of fear, a lot of, you know, anxiety around that decision, but what the, the, the decision that we landed on was like, okay, we'll, we'll take the next 12 months. So we'll take all of 2021 to really just focus on growing the business. And if we're happy with where the business is at, at the end of the year, then Tony doesn't have to go back to work anymore. Right. But if we're not happy with where we're at, then I, I got to go out and get a job. So, but like, you know, busted my ass for all of 2021. And, you know, we, we started that year. We had just bought our third property before I got fired at the, at the tail end of 2020. By the end of 2021, we got to 12 listings, right? So we added another nine properties over the next 12 months. So it was, it was crazy, man. And I don't think I would have been able to do that with any other asset class to really replace my income in a way that I was um, with the short-term rentals. So um, I totally agree with you, man. The, the ability to, to scale and to quickly replace your W-2 income, I think short-term rentals is one of the best asset classes to do so. Do you, um, do you arbitrage at all? Or are these all owned properties? They're all owned properties. So I have, I have friends at arbitrage. Um, I've got one buddy that's got like, I don't know, 30 plus units, you know, makes money hand over fist. Um, but I, I think something that's important to me, at least on, in these initial phases is, uh, is equity, right? Like we want to be able to, to participate in some of that upside. Um, you know, like, like, you know, I became a millionaire, Bo, because of the equity in these properties, right? That, that's kind of built up over the last couple of years. And if I was doing arbitrage, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but the, but the beauty of business is, is that if you have limited means at this time and you don't have a financial friend network where they might want to invest in your deals, right. there's that opportunity to totally to furnish with on a credit card, um, yeah. sign a master lease and arbitrage that deal. I know. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, midterm rentals? Like, uh, traveling nurses and furnish furnish finders and that kind of thing. Yeah. Any interest in Another that at all? Yeah. Another great opportunity, you know, and it's something that we're looking at as well. Um, but it, it, it's that model works better in a more urban market. Um, right. So where you're, you're kind of in like the, the major uh, metros or places where, where there's that, that, you know, that, that hospital, right. Um, our market selection is more so true vacation rental market. So, you know, we're, we're, we're investing in cities where the main economic driver is vacation and tourism, right? It's like, I don't, even though I live close to Los Angeles, we don't own anything in LA because LA has got, you've got the ports, you've got film, you've got music, you've got business headquarters, you've got literally every big industry in LA. They don't care about Airbnbs. They don't care about protecting the short-term rental operators. But if you go into a market like the Smoky Mountains or Joshua Tree, where we invest, there, there are no major headquarters. There's no uh, big universities. Like the only thing driving that economy is people coming in, visiting the national park, staying for a night or two and paying Airbnb hosts like, like me. Um, so our focus on the market selection side has been more so on these true vacation rental markets. Um, but if we do move into like a major metro, I think our focus will be more so on like the, the business professionals or the traveling nurses that are staying for kind of that, that midterm stay. Yeah. Yeah. My friend does that in Sacramento. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't know if you have, he's been on the bigger pockets before Al Williamson. Yeah. He's okay. that's all he does is midterm. He's like, uh, they call him the, the, like the landlord scientist, but anyways, he's awesome. If you ever want him to bring, you should look him up and bring him on, okay. your, on your show. Cause he's like mastered the whole, uh, midterm rental thing. And, and it's, okay. it's pretty cool. I mean, it, yeah. you know, I, I and, and plus in, in, in other areas, where they have regulations, a lot of people are, have to shift, and and right. you know, you get around a lot of the regulations by doing thirty plus days. But also, we got to keep abreast of what's going on with all these legislation and right. regulations, and it's kind of a, a pain. And I think you should be able to do whatever you want with your own property. That you right. own. But, <laughs> right. but who, who who am I? <laughs> who so, are we? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so if you if somebody's watching this right now or in the future when it's edited. And they're like, wow, this is a great conversation. I really want to kind of like get a little bit better grasp of the whole 
STR world, the short-term rental world, where would you advise them to like, what is there a certain podcast? Do you have, do you have like a, like a, like kind of a class you do or yeah. where, where, where should they start? Yeah. So um, first we're, we're hosting an in-person event. Um, when does this air, Bo? Um, this will air in like the next seven to 10 days, probably. Oh, perfect. Okay. Awesome. So we're hosting an in-person event. Uh, it's uh, called the Real Estate Robinson Short-Term Rental Ride-Along. Uh, so we, we essentially have people come out. They come to Southern California where we're at. Uh, we spend uh, a day and a half talking everything short-term rentals, but, but we actually get on a charter bus uh, we drive around the city of Joshua Tree. We go to multiple of our properties. Uh, we meet our cleaners. You guys get to meet our, our designer, our lender, our agents, and really just see all the inner workings of how we run our short-term rental business. So if you guys want to attend, uh, just go to strridealong.com. So that's strridealong.com. You guys can pick up a seat. Um, and then we're also we're also hosting a, a larger event uh, in the springtime. I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the fall time. If you go to strsummits.com, you can join the wait list for that as well. Um, so that's STR Summit. And then uh, last, if you just want education uh, on YouTube, my wife and I have a YouTube channel called The Real Estate Robinsons. Uh, so just look that up and you guys can get, you know, we, we share so much on that on that channel for absolutely free. Awesome. That's so cool. Um, this definitely is interesting. And um, yeah, Joshua Trees, uh, uh, one of my contacts is I see him, he's buying and rehabbing and then converting to short-term rentals in Joshua Tree. And yeah. I started looking at some other, there's some other cities over there that are pretty popular too, but not as popular as Joshua Tree. So mm -hmm. um, like Yucca Valley, it seems like people yeah. are going in there now and in places like that. So, wow, Tony, thank you so much for your time. This was really, it was a good interview. Like I, it, I think every interview I do kind of inspires me in certain ways. And this definitely, it pushes me to like, I got to get that first short-term rental. It makes sense. And so I'm still debating, do I want to go to Lake Havasu? Because I wanted something that I could use maybe, you know, 14, day, 14 days out of the year. Yeah. Um, for me, I was thinking, well, how, what's the best way to finance one? If I actually use it 14 days or so, I can buy it as a second home totally. and get some perks there. So um, there's a lot of options. So I was thinking what is in like a two or three hour radius for me here in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And then I can use it once or twice uh, a year or three times a year, and then also make a hopefully a, a boatload of money with it. So yeah, that, that's, that's the beauty of it, man. You get to use it yourself and, and enjoy the profits. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thanks everybody for watching, please like, and subscribe. And I'll put the links to the events below in the show notes. So if you guys are uh, wanting to step up your game, it sounds like a great opportunity actually like, you know, go drive properties, learn how they're turning over properties, kind of like, taking the nervousness out of the whole process. Because I think mm -hmm. once you get your first one under your belt, you're like, okay, now I, I got it. I, and you figure out that it's not that hard and it's not that scary. Yeah. So, all right. Thanks so much, Tony. I appreciate you both. Thank you, man.